Okay, my friends, welcome to the next episode here at the Red Delta Project podcast, live feed Q&A, simplifying fitness via a fundamental approach to help you break free of the diet and exercise rat race. I'm Matt Schifferly, and today's episode is sponsored by the brand new little ebook, a PDF I call my quick read series, all on adaptive training. Adaptive training is one of the strategies that I used to or started to implement several years ago, and by far it's one of the most important things I have ever done to make my workouts safer, more effective, and a lot more friendly on mind, body, and lifestyle. So I wrote a little bit of a PDF on it. It's not a very quick read. That's why I call my uh, my. Uh, My quick read series is just on the PDF for right now. It's not even on Amazon, although that will be changing in the near future. But the link for those is down below. They're also at a very friendly price point as well. And I'm very happy to bring this to you because, as I said before, if there's anything, if you came to me in a party and you were like, what is one of the most important, impactful, and revolutionary ways you've drastically improved your training over the past several years? Adaptive training. No question about it by far a more enjoyable way to go about things, making things safer and more effective. So that is now available down below in the description. And also speaking about things that are relatively simple, that make a massive difference in your workouts. Today, we are talking about the art and science of tension control. Because if there's also, aside from the adaptive training, anything that can make your workouts a lot safer, a lot more enjoyable, and a lot more effective, I would say improve tension control. In fact, if you're starting off and you were like, I want to make my workouts as effective as possible, I would tell you focus on developing some of that tension control first and foremost. Because even if everything else in your workout was the same, use the same resistance, the same exercises, the same programming, even the same technique, but you improve your tension control, it will make a huge difference in the quality and effectiveness of your workouts. But the opposite's the case too. If your tension control is not very good, which is very common these days in at least some way, shape, or form, you can have everything else, quote, optimized. You can have the best technique. You can have the best programming, the best equipment, the best everything, and you're still going to have frustration in your journey to get very limited results. That's why we're mentioning this, and I want to clear the air with a few myths, first and foremost, while answering your questions here over on the RDP YouTube channel. And the first myth is when I talk about uh, tension control, people often assume that I'm talking about things like mind-muscle connection, and there's this idea that it's a very bro science woo-woo thing that's uh, uh, not really proven by science and everything. And the fact of the matter is I couldn't possibly be more f- uh, further from the truth. Saying that you don't believe in, quote, the mind-muscle connection or tension control is like a computer programmer who's steeped in hardware and software, and they program, and they got computers all over the place, and they make their entire career about computers, and they've got a tattoo of a you know computer chip on their forehead and everything, and they're like, yeah, I'm all about computers. But you know what? I don't believe in this electricity thing. It's like, well, how do you think this whole thing works, dude? It's the exact same thing. Tension control is the fundamental element of effective training. It is what everything about your training works. Whether you want to get stronger, more powerful, build muscle, burn calories, every little thing in your workouts depends entirely on the ability to produce and stimulate tension in your muscles. That's the entire point of training. And when we people are like, oh, mind muscle connection doesn't work or anything like that, what they're doing is they're using ineffective methods or they're using, uh, citing some sort of obscure data point that came out years ago. It's like, well, these researchers, they ask people to think about their muscle while they're training and it didn't really do anything. Well, of course not. You know, I can think about a light bulb all day long, it's not going to turn on. Thinking about your muscles is not what we're talking about at all. In fact, it has very little to do with your actual muscles at all. And that's why it's not, quote, muscle control. As I promise you, you don't need to control your muscles. They are very firmly attached to your bones. <laughs> they aren't going anywhere. You don't need to control your muscles. Instead, it's called tension control. We are talking about creating and controlling 
the tension in the muscles. Big difference. Very, very big difference. And when we start thinking about things like, oh, I'm thinking about my muscles or this is mind-muscle connection and everything is bro science and everything, we're totally off in la-la land. That is complete science fiction. Because you pick up any sort of neuromuscular textbook, exercise, uh, kinesiology, exercise physiology 101, anything that basically says this is how your muscles work. And the entire thing is about how do you generate and control tension in your muscles? This is the neural process. This is how your brain plays a function in it. This is the chemical process to it. These are the actin and myosin filaments. Everything about exercise is basically tension control. And one of the things that we often miss is the fact that we can improve said tension control. And that's what we're talking about today is how do you improve upon it? Because again, if you do not improve your tension control, you're always going to be extremely limited in your results. You're always going to struggle to make the muscle bigger and stronger, regardless of any other variables. I don't care what your programming is like. I don't care how good your technique is. Everything else is going to do very little for you at best. But you improve that tension control, and literally overnight, things can change in a big way for you. And the last myth that I wanted to really address is this idea that your tension control is not something you can improve upon. You know, a lot of times it's something that is part of our subliminal programming. There's a lot, as I'm learning, especially now from more research and a fundamental approach to fitness, there's so much about fitness as is life that is dependent upon what we subliminally and subconsciously do as human beings. And a lot of the real power to improve things in our lives and our fitness comes not from doing things that we consciously are aware of and control, but taking the things that we do on subconscious autopilot, bringing it up to our conscious level. So we're now thinking about it and we're now trying to improve it. And then once we habitually get it working in, in a higher level, then we can put it back into our subconscious, uh, basically vault. And then it runs on autopilot to do things better. So I always think of like software again on a computer. Most of the time, like I'm using several pieces of technology here. There's software working in the back room. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's doing. It's doing it all completely automatically. But if there's a bug in the system or something's not right, then an engineer would take out essentially the source code. They'd look at it and be like, oh, this is where that problem is. And they're consciously reprogramming it. And then they put it back in and it works much better and I don't have to think about it. That's literally what tension control is. Most of us are utilizing the tension throughout our muscles, using our muscles, in other words, on a very subconscious, subliminal level. And so that's why a lot of times people will be able to get better results than other people. And they're like, I don't know, I'm just doing the bicep curls. I'm just doing this workout. And they've got like a ton of other people doing the same thing and they're not getting even close to that. And they're like, what's different? And the reason is for whatever reason, that person has got better tension control in their muscles or those muscles that have, they've been able to develop. And they don't know it. They're, they're completely unaware of it as they should be because they just had it. And so that's one of the biggest reasons why we struggle with this is because a lot of our training proficiency is what we're doing with our muscles on subconscious autopilot. So if it's bad, and not very good, it's always going to be bad, and it's going to stay bad, and it's never probably going to improve very much. But the point of today's video is to, an episode is to give you the tools so you can take those subconscious tension control programming variables, bring them to your conscious level, reprogram them to be much better and more effective, and then you can let them go back into subconscious autopilot, and everything you do for the rest of your life will be greatly enhanced and elevated. Also be answering your questions. Ben Ben's good to see you. Brian Lendog saying, hey, Matt. Uh, was asking, hey, Matt, been booked in a long off-road ride this summer. Very good. Lots of hills. Did it last year. Nearly killed me. <laughs> Any tips for training, plans, exercise, advice? Yeah, ride hills, my friend. Ride hills. Get specific. First off, you are working your legs, right? Don't make the mistake that I made and a lot of other people make when it comes to cycling and running and things. They're like, oh, I'm a cyclist. I don't need to work my legs. You know, I get my legs work plenty, you know, is sort of thing. No, it's 
the opposite. Of course I work my legs because I'm a cyclist. <laughs> and of course I need to work hard because I'm going to be riding hills and stuff. And when you're going off road, that's a whole nother ball game altogether too. So the question I would ask is how much are you used to off road things? Because if I'm riding on a road bike, the level of intensity and the resistance on my legs is relatively constant when I'm on flat pavement. And then if I start going up a hill, it's a fairly gradual increase. And then uh, it's kind of a same incline. And then you're kind of going at a steady state of pace. But when you're off road, it's kind of like running hill sprints where you start going up a hill and, oh, I've got a power over this uh, rocky section. So suddenly you've got a huge demand on your legs for the next 20 seconds. And then you can kind of start to pedal and you spin your wheels a little bit more and you're like, oh, now I've got this tricky switch back. So you've got a power, 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 and then you can relax a bit and power, 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 and then you relax a little bit. So you, I would basically say ride hills off road if you're not already. If you're doing a lot of flatland work on a road bike, yeah, you're going to be woefully unprepared for off-road hills, which are going to work your legs to a whole nother level. So basically ride what you plan on riding, that kind of terrain, that kind of uh, duration and intensity. Be very specific about it. I remember back in the day, you know, with the Tour de France, cyclists would go and they would ride up Alp X, the actual rides they were riding in the Tour. They weren't looking for some sort of what kind of exercise bike program do I use? No, you go up the actual mountain. So make it specific, my friend, and that will get your body much more uh, used to the activity that you're about to do, also mentally and emotionally as well. And uh, ben, uh, ben is saying, hey, Matt, I live in a hot country. I usually cut in spring, summertime. Yep, this year, for the first time, I started my cut mid-January, and it's so much easier to get my cardio because of lower temperatures. Yeah, fantastic. Absolutely. You know, people come in and they hide and they take refuge from mother nature during the cold weather. Those are usually some of the best times to get outside and work out. Uh, as they say, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad gear. And uh, I go out, I hike up mountains and stuff during the winter and stuff. It is definitely a heck of a lot better. Michael's coming on saying, yes, change the question. How much can you squat to the best question? How well can you squat? Very good. Yep. Because it is about proficiency here, my friends. It is about how well you do the thing. And in everything else in life, we naturally know this. I don't care how hard you can play the guitar. I care about how well you can play the guitar if you're going to join this rock band. I don't care about how hard you can sell if you're working in a business where you have to sell. I care about how well can you sell? This is a skill, my friends. Strength training and basically any physical training that we want to do well is a skill. And too often we come into it thinking, I'm just going to work myself into the ground. I'm going to push myself as hard as possible. And that's going to be the secret or the key to getting what I want. And I promise you, I can play guitar very, very hard. I can do it until my, my uh, fingertips are bleeding, until I'm breaking strings, until my arms are so sore that I can barely lift them. And I guarantee you it's still going to sound terrible because I can't play the guitar for crap. So it's not how hard we're working, it's how well. And coincidentally, when you do things a lot better, you can push harder. You can push a lot harder, but you're also getting far more productivity out of the effort that you are putting in. Excuse me, I drink my water. Always remember, we will over rely on hard work and effort, especially when we are not proficient and we are inept at knowing how to work or do the thing well. You, a good way to spot someone who doesn't know what they're doing, see how much they're bragging about how hard they work. How much, like, I work twice as hard as everyone else, and no one works harder than me, and everything. It's like, you're probably one of the most incompetent workers here, too. Not always. You know, I'm sure there's exceptions, but lots of times, the hardest worker is the most incompetent worker. Meanwhile, you've got individuals out there like, yeah, I went in the office for three hours, and I made an entire week's worth of sales. Like, that dude's so lazy. It's like, no, he's not lazy. He's good. <laughs> the better you are at something, the more, quote, lazy you can be about it. So let's start talking a little bit about what tension control is. What am I talking about with this to get really down to brass tacks? 
Well, as I talked about in one of my previous videos this past week about improving tension control, is that there's two primary variables to tension control. One is, can you engage a given muscle to begin with? That should be very obvious. Like if you, you're sitting there, can you engage your lats? Can you engage your calves? Can you engage your pecs and so on? And this should be very obvious because we feel the muscle engage and the more we engage it, the more we feel it. And again, a lot of times people will say, well, it doesn't matter if you don't feel the muscle work and how it feels doesn't really matter, yada, yada, yada. I kind of get what they're saying, but it's nonsense. It's like telling a, a chef in a kitchen, it doesn't matter how your food tastes. I don't care if you're, if you're uh, you know, quail, uh, chicken breast or whatever, tastes terrible. All that matters is how it looks. You know, it, it could look uh, absolutely gorgeous. That's all that the customer cares about. It doesn't matter if, you know, the, the steak is, is green and, uh, or looking terrible and everything. It's just how does it look? That's all, like, all that matters and stuff. Of course, that'd be ridiculous, but that's exactly what we're telling people when we say it doesn't matter how the muscle feels. It matters is just do you have the right technique and stuff. Absolutely wrong. Hun could not possibly be more wrong because how it feels is ex telling you exactly what's going on under the surface. If you are doing an exercise and you don't feel the muscle working, that muscle will struggle to get bigger and stronger, regardless of any variables. But if you're doing the exercise and you're like, wow, I'm really feeling that in my chest or my triceps or whatever, that's a very good sign that it's certainly doing quite a bit for you. So that's the first level is the engagement of the muscle. Can you turn it on? You can only work a muscle to the degree you can engage it. If you can't engage it very much, you're pretty much up a creek with it. And the second level is can you get the engagement of several muscles to work synergistically along a chain? This is why we use chain training here at Red Delta Project. We don't work muscles. We don't work movements. We work tension chains, which is basically the best of both worlds. If you have really good tension chain engagement, then you'll be very powerful and athletic and quote functional at every movement you ever use that chain for. And if you have good synergistic engagement, you'll have very good development and strengthening of every single muscle along those, along that chain. So you don't get the pros and the cons of muscle, muscle control or muscle in, uh, working like with bodybuilding. And you also don't have the pitfalls of quote, working muscles and quote, functional training. You get the, all the benefits of both and none of the downsides of either. That's the great thing about tension uh, control with chain training. That's why all of my books, literally starting from smart body weight training, are all about chain training. And you'll always hear me say in my programs, today I did a push chain, pull chain, squat chain, flexion, extension, lateral chain. I even have one of my quick reads is push, pull, squat. Why? Because in the interest of building a stronger, more aesthetic body, if you want to build your body up, pushing, pulling, and squatting chains are where the lion's share of that stimulus is going to come from. That's where you should focus your workouts. So when we're working these tension chains, what we're really doing is mentally saying, okay, can I engage my muscles individually? And can I get them to all link so that when I'm doing the exercise, I feel the entire chain working as a cohesive unit? I'm gonna be posting a video a little bit later on how to drastically improve your pull-ups and get all that nasty tension and stress out of your elbows so they don't hurt anymore. And basically the idea behind it, and you'll see how I do it in the video, is you engage the muscles along the entire pull chain, your lats, your traps, your shoulders, your biceps, your grip, and then you use it as a cohesive unit in your pull-ups. And I'll be detailing how that goes about in the video, of course, so make sure you're following and subscribed and checking back on the channel and stuff. But that's how that works, is when you have this synergistic engagement of all the muscles along the chain, your workouts are far more effective, a hell of a lot safer, they feel amazing, and your performance goes through the roof as well. So those are the two elements of tension control we're striving for. Can you get the muscle to engage in the first place on the individual level? Can you get your lats on? Can you get your rear delts on? Can you get your biceps on and so on? And then can you get them all to link together synergistically 
along the entire chain. If you can do that, then you're going to have vastly different feeling workouts that are much safer and much more effective than if you did pull-ups and you're like, dude, it's all in my biceps. I barely feel my back at all. Completely different scenario. Joseph Bello, it's good to see you again. Saying, hello, Matt. I have increased my range of motion in my squats. Good man. And I feel my muscles and my quads engage more. Even better. Uh, I did body weight squat yesterday and went in lunges right after the squats. I can feel it. Absolutely. And that's really, I mean, I'm boasting about the tension control here, folks, because literally that is the entire point of strength training. The, I don't care if you're trying to get stronger or perform better or build bigger muscles or get six pack abs or whatever your goal is. The entire point of all forms of strength training in every way, shape and form is to get tension in the muscles. That is the whole goal. That is why we're doing all of it. Okay. And so if you can't really get that tension in the muscles, then everything you're working for is, is going to be a struggle at best. So that's why I'm harping so much on this is because that is the point. So Joseph here, I've been coaching him along for his leg training on improving his squats and everything. And right there, he's like, yeah, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the muscles like they're working a little more and maybe a little sore and stuff. It's like, yeah, because you're using your tension better. You're engaging the muscles to a better degree. And little side note here, one of the things that uh, he's pointed out is, you know, when you get down into the bottom of a squat, it's harder to engage in muscles because it's harder usually to engage a muscle in an elongated position. Like a lot of guys can make a bicep flex really hard. I got a lot of tension in my bicep when, you know, I'm quote, making a muscle. But if my arm is straight, can you engage your biceps? Can you keep your bicep tense or is it just kind of going bleh? So that's something to work on. Because having good tension control in a muscle in an elongated position not only helps protect the joints quite a bit, it also drastically improves your mobility as well. And Joseph is a great example there. Thank you very much for coming on in, Joseph. Jim Bob, it's good to see you. Hey, Matt, thanks for all the advice. You're more than welcome. I got a pair of rings. Good job. Congrats. Can you speak about cues like chin and shoulder cues doing dips? I seem to feel tension control better. Uh, I just go about it, quote, normal. Very good. So one of the things to recognize about dips is that they are very much a back exercise and you want to be using your back as your foundation when you're doing dips, uh, especially on rings or straps or whatnot. So one of the things I often have people do, if you can, depends on your environment, of course, is set up your rings so that they're just about like belly height. So you're not like jumping up into the ring, uh, into the dip position. Instead, the way I much prefer to do it, especially if I'm doing them with extra weight, is have them at a height so that you can basically kind of push yourself up into the top of the dip position with your feet about two inches off the floor. And then when you do the dip, you just pick up your legs. And that's gonna make it a lot easier to establish the tension in your chest, your back, your lats, your triceps, your shoulders, even your grip and everything. Uh, so that's the setup. Setup is very key. A uh, second is when you are doing your dips, imagine you're like squeezing lemons in your armpits. And this again is to improve the adduction of your back. We often think of the lats as spreading wide, going outwards and stuff. It, it's the opposite. We want to adduct. We want to squeeze backwards as if we're hugging behind ourselves with our back muscles. So when you're doing this, try not to have the rings like internally rotate too much as you're coming down, but try to keep them as neutral as possible. Film yourself with your camera, uh, like on your smartphone and stuff, and see how much of a gap you've got between your arms, especially your upper arm and your torso. Over time, you want that gap to be as small as possible. But a lot of times people, when they're doing dips, especially in rings, because they're very telling, they'll have like this big gap between their arms and their torso and they'll be more stable if they squeeze in. And again, a lot of that squeeze is going to come from your back. Uh, so that's the other. And the other thing, as I often tell people, is just shoulders away from your ears. Get your shoulders down away from your ears. Don't let them hunch up when you're doing that sort of thing. EE e. is saying, Matt, you said you got uh, ADHD. What? What were you talking about? Oh, yes. <laughs> ADHD. Uh, how do you handle 
your past as a child and teen. I didn't. It's uh, I grew up in a time and place where it's like, well, I guess you're just kind of dumb in class and uh, you have a problem with things. <laughs> That's the way it was when I was growing up. I didn't handle it. There was nothing to handle. There was no tools. There was no way to kind of get through it. A lot of it is just knowing kind of the way that you work. And it's a good little parable there with fitness as well. We all have our challenges in life. We all have just quote quirks and the ways that we are kind of thing. And when you recognize just kind of the ways that your brain thinks and functions and stuff, you experiment and you find ways of working with these issues and stuff. So my ADHD is a lot of times people think that ADHD is when you're easily distracted and you're like, oh, something shiny. Oh, look at this new thing. Oh, look at that. I have more of the like super mega hyper focus type of ADHD where I'm the, the kind of guy, like if we go to a restaurant, for example, and it's a sports bar or something, there's a TV on, I have to face away from that TV because it will suck my attention to you. And you could literally be in front of me going, Matt, Matt, hey, Matt. And I won't even hear you. I won't even see you because I'll just be super fixated on, you know, whatever it's the home shopping network or whatever on that TV. So I've always been extremely focused in that. And I use that to my advantage. If I'm starting to edit a video or writing a book or something like that, I don't understand. People are like, oh man, I get on my computer. I get so distracted by social media and everything like that. Not at all a problem for me. Like if I start writing a book or editing a video, Instagram could be all over, uh, you know, another screen or whatever, won't even pay attention to it, won't attract me whatsoever. So I'm super hyper mega focused in that regard. Uh, so you can set up, a lot of it is also environmental too. You know, I learned that if I had to study better or something difficult, I'd turn off all the lights and I'd have just my little desk light and I'd have you know, like my favorite music playing in the background, something that was very familiar to me. Uh, in high school in particular, I was a big Pink Floyd fan. So Pink Floyd's the wall, just playing on loop, you know, while I'm doing my math homework. So everything was super mega hyper focused on that math homework. And that's how I would actually be able to pass a math class. Because I, to this day, I have no idea what math actually <laughs> I was studying and stuff. To me, it was all just moving numbers on a sheet of paper. That's all math ever was. It never actually made any sense to me. So learning these things, and again, with fitness, same thing. If you know in your bones that you hate running on a treadmill, but you love trail running, well, then why the hell are you buying a treadmill? Go outside and run in the snow and you know, get some appropriate clothing and gator and stuff like that. But when we have these types of experiences of negativity, like I just, it, this doesn't work for me. I'm just not getting it with this. Well, then stop beating your head against that thing and do something else. If you feel like for me, in my experience, I just have a hell of a time making a barbell work for me. I just can't get the muscles to engage the way I want it to. It's really, really just hard on my body, but it's harder for me to push my muscles. It's just, I can't work my body nearly as effectively with a barbell. Dumbbells are a second, but calisthenics still takes the cake. So I just know that about myself and I don't care why that's the case. It doesn't matter. If I needed to be a power lifter, it would matter, but it doesn't for me. So I'm like, okay, fine. I'm just not going to focus on barbell work. And there you go. Work with the body, not against it. Ellen lost in Canada. It's easy to do. It's a big place. <laughs> what is your opinion? The recent push by longevity experts to eat a minimum one gram of protein per pound body weight with the implication any less will compromise long-term health. Honestly, I, I haven't heard about that. And honestly, I couldn't possibly care less. Uh, a lot of times these studies and ideas come about about these metrics and stuff like that. And But if you look at it from a 30,000 foot view, a lot of this, these studies are pretty meaningless uh, because it doesn't change anything about a good sound approach to diet and exercise, right? One pound, what would you say? Pound per uh, gram per pound. Okay. Pound versus kilogram. Always make sure you get that metric right. Because a lot of times something will come out saying one gram per kilogram, and then people will just forget the kilogram part and say one pound. And now you're talking about doubling things up. Um, 
I mean, nutrition is one of those very nuanced things where the amount of protein you should be eating depends on many variables. It depends on genetics. It depends on your build. It depends on your activity level. It depends on your age. It depends on the other aspects of nutrition. It depends on what activities you're doing. It depends on what kind of sleep you're getting. It depends on what kind of strength training you're doing. It depends on how much damage your muscles are getting. It depends on your rate of recovery. It depends. I mean, the actual protein requirement you have depends on so many variables. Whenever we get a study like this saying we'd recommend this much protein, it's practically meaningless because it's like, okay, but what does that mean for me? Which is why I largely ignore all these things because there's always going to be debate and there's always going to be people saying yes and no, and you need more. And some people say less and stuff. And again, largely meaningless paralysis by analysis doesn't help you one bit. So that's why I always tell people one, just like with exercise, just get a stable, steady diet. What foods are you eating on a regular basis and get your diet to be stable and steady? That by far is more important than any other metric. I don't care how many calories you're eating. I don't care how much protein you're getting. If your diet is all over the place, then any metrics you're trying to follow will be impossible for one. And two, your body is constantly getting thrown all over the place. So get your diet to be stable. Make sure you're getting a good, decent protein source at each meal. Okay, so that's always been part of my 3P strategy, plant protein portion size. You get those three things dialed in for each meal, you're pretty much fine with diet. You don't have to worry about anything else. Everything is just going to fall right into place for you. And you should be able to look at your meal and be like, yep, that's a good protein source right there. That's how big it should be. That's how good um, uh, in, um elemental your protein should be with every meal. And then if you're ever like, I wonder if I should do more protein, well, then just eat more of it. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. I usually eat three eggs in the morning. Great. We'll make it six. See if anything happens. And again, you're looking for very positive feedback. Like, dude, I started to eat six eggs in the morning. Holy smokes. Do I feel good? I feel amazing. My body is so much better. I'm not hungry at 11 a.m. You know, you're looking for that kind of feedback. You're not looking for the, well, I guess it might help me live another five years down the road. No, any type of diet and exercise habits that we have that are going to produce a big long-term impact are probably going to be things that should also produce a short-term benefit as well. It should make you feel better today. It should make you feel better when you're eating it. But if you're cramming that, those eggs down and you're like, oh, I was eating three eggs and I felt great. Now I eat six and I feel Ugh, like it's so much food. I don't know. I'm you know, bloated and tired afterwards. Well, it's probably a sign you shouldn't be eating six eggs kind of thing. That's what you should go off of. I don't care what these folks are saying. Like, this is how much protein you should be eating. And this study says, yeah, yeah, sure, fine, whatever. I don't care. It's meaningless against your own experience. And that goes for everything with diet and exercise. I don't care if someone's like, running is the best exercise in the world. If you have a terrible experience with it and you're getting far better results from rollerblading, then you go rollerblading. I was responding to an uh, email the other day and someone was asking me this uh, question about workout programming. And he's like, well, this expert says this is best and this expert says that is best and stuff. Who cares what I think? Who cares what I, I could bring up a thousand million studies saying this type of approach is best. And if you try that approach and you get worse results, it's worse for you. Full stop. Don't do it. You know, studies should not be in charge. Your experience is what should be in charge. And that's what we want to base things off of. You want to eat more protein? Yeah, go for it. You don't need a study to convince you to do that. Just try it. See what happens. If it doesn't benefit you, then it doesn't benefit you. Zaid saying, hey, Matt, music helps you focus. Does the idea that music while working out is uh, cheating by Goggins hold any merit? No, it does not. It does not hold any merit whatsoever. Uh, cheating, cheating how? It's not a sport, dude. You can only cheat if it's a sport. You know, when people are doing a, a, an exercise sometimes, like they're doing pull-ups in that last rep and they lift up their legs and stuff to get that last rep and they're like, oh, I cheated. And I'm like, no, you didn't. You can only cheat if it's sports, if it's a game. This is not a game. Fitness is not a game, my friends. It's not cheating. It's called a regression. Or in the case of music, it's just simply training better, right? It's so, it, that'd be like saying wearing more comfortable shoes is cheating, right? Drinking water is cheating. 
This is this, this stupid idea that we have in our fitness culture that things that make things easier on an effort level are bad and that things that increase effort are good. That is completely false. I fell for that idea for many years myself and I deeply, deeply regret it. I wish I could go back in time to my younger self who is not drinking water on the hot days, who is purposely doing things just because they were hard and doing things as I had an ego the size of, you know, like crazy. And I needed to prove myself. And the way I proved myself was putting myself through hell in my workouts and literally making myself blood, sweat, and tears. I wish I could go back to that younger self, smack myself upside the head, say, you're a freaking idiot. You're dumb for doing these things. You need to do this harder. But I'm riding my bike during the hottest time of the day. Exactly. It's 98 degrees and 100% humidity. Why are you doing this? Wait three hours when it's going to be a beautiful evening with no wind. Go out for your bike ride. Then it's going to be a lot more comfortable. And you know what's going to happen when you're more comfortable? You're going to be able to work so much more effectively. Right now, you're just uh, slogging up this hill, feeling like crap. And you're going to have heat stroke for the rest of the day which means you're just going to lay on the couch and bitch about it and be a wuss the rest of the day to everyone else. Instead, stay inside, watch a movie, hydrate, eat very well. Then you go and you crush. We had a, a hill called Irish Hill over in Burlington, which was a stupid incline to it. It's like, then instead of going up at once, you're going to go up at five times and you're going to be far stronger for the UVM cycling season. Easier is not Worse, my friends, if you listen to music and you have a better workout, it's better. If it feels easier and you can lift more weights and do more weight, it's better. Full stop. Harder is not better. Do not fall for that idea. It is flat out wrong. Benjamin Drobel, Dumbro, excuse me, coming out. While tension is extremely important, this is taken care of by sufficient loads and good technique. Wrong. No, it's not. It often is influenced by those things, but it will not take care of you. Uh, after a certain point, you get massively diminished returns, though, and the real driver of progress is effort through either volume or in set intensity. I agree with you there. Yes. Realistically, but although the volume and intensity are set by your tension, though, realistically, how much muscle have you personally gained in the past three years of training with your methods? Much more. But you've also got to take that into consideration that I'm 46 and I've been training for 20 years. You know, at this point in my career, I'm not going to make gains no matter what I do to any appreciable degree, because most of your progress is going to be made in the first three to five years. If your training is on point after that, you're just not going to make much headway beyond that. You're going to be dialing in little bits. But this is the thing that nobody ever talks about in fitness is that if you have a 40 year career, you're going to spend most of that not making much progress no matter what you do unless you make some very big changes to your chemistry, like with steroids and stuff. But the tension control, A, has definitely made massive differences in, quote, stubborn muscles that were never easy to gain, particularly my lats, particularly my shoulders, my glutes, and my hamstrings. Okay, Those were areas that I always had poor tension control with and never really realized it. And when I got better tension control with, I mean, I had to take five shirts to the Goodwill last year because it's like, oh, my back is finally growing on me now. So it's definitely made a huge difference. But the, that's the big mistake, again, my friend, that we all that I made for years. It's thinking as long as the load is there and as long as the technique is there, I'll be good. Dead wrong. <laughs> I made that mistake for so long. And posterior chain was definitely a big example of that sort of thing. I had coaches like, look at me. What is wrong with my deadlift? Why is this hurting my back? And they'd be like, I don't know. Your technique looks great. Your technique is on point. Back is straight and hip hinge. Yeah, yeah. Everything about your technique is great. You know why technique doesn't work is because you can compensate like crazy for muscles that aren't engaging very well, which is exactly my case. I would do deadlifts correctly in quotes. Programming would be on point and everything like that. It's like, my back is still killing me. I guess I just have the wrong genetics for it or something like that. But if you, again, if you ask me like, well, how much are you feeling in the glutes? I'd be like, uh, sure. I, I guess the glutes are on. They're there, I guess, kind of thing. Then I started to improve attention control years later. And I'm like, let me try these deadlifts. And like, whoa, holy smokes. This is what deadlifts are supposed to feel like? Wow, holy, you all are doing deadlifts like this? 
oh man, I've been missing out. I've been doing them wrong for the past 15 years. Holy smokes. And that's the beauty of tension control. It radically transforms an exercise in how your body's relating to it. And yeah, the load matters. And yes, technique matters. Absolutely. But it will not control tension for you. Do not make that mistake because you can have your, ten your technique dialed in perfectly and the tension control is still terrible because you're compensating with it, which is extremely common. And boy, oh boy, don't I wish I knew that back in the day. Would have made a lot faster progress. Peter Birdsall saying, Matt, do you ever jump in ice water before you work out? They say that uh, there are many benefits to it. I did it one time. I did an ice bath challenge one time. And afterwards, I was like, I feel like exercising. I got a lot of, um, uh, you know, a uh, lot of energy and stuff. It's like, I just want to work out and stuff like that. I used to, um, not uh, ice water, but uh, back in Vermont, we would jump in, you know, swimming holes in the summer, which... Boy, you talk about an energy transformation. You know, again, we'd be like 90 degrees, 100% humidity in Vermont. We're all like slugs on the front porch being like, oh my God, like I've got no energy. If you were like, let's go work out. And I'd be like, are you kidding me? I feel like my body is so drained of energy from the summer heat and humidity and everything. It sucks. And I'm like, well, let's jump in this swimming hole, which is like mountain runoff, <laughs> melted snow. And part of it was the adrenaline of jumping off a cliff and everything. And then we'd do that. And then we'd come home and like, I'm going to go ride my bike for 50 miles. You know, I'm going to go and do a thousand pushups and stuff. So from that energy standpoint, it could very well help. But again, look at your experience. You know, the cold shower thing. I tried the cold shower thing for a while from, to wake up in the morning. And my friends would be like, how was it? Isn't it awesome? Like, no, I was warm and tired when I woke up. And now I'm cold and tired after that shower. It didn't do anything for me at all. So listen to your experience. I think it could do a good thing for refreshing, but also look at just simple practicality too. Um, one thing that I learned from that ice bath challenge was, you know, we had to go out, we got the ice, we filled it with the bathtub and everything. And it, it was like, dude, it's like an hour's worth of work to do this ice bath. And I was like, this is really time consuming. Like, I'm not going to do this a lot. Of, I don't have time for this kind of thing. Uh, so Take the practicality into it. Does it really make a difference is really what you want to be looking from your experience. There's a very good chance you may do it and be like, yeah, it just made me cold. And that was it. It could drain you of energy too. You could do the ice bath and afterwards being like, dude, I'm not working out now. I feel like crap. So experiment with it. Whenever we get these ideas and things online about you know some hack or trick or something like that, chances are it's going to work very well, but only in certain circumstances for certain people. Are you going to fit that? Maybe, but there's also a chance it may do nothing for you. And you're like, well, now I'm just cold, cranky, and I don't feel like working out. In that case, you're like, yeah, don't do it. <laughs> don't, don't do that sort of thing. Is uh... Oh, Peter is coming in. Hardest job our body has is to digest food. Uh, no, it's to run our brain. Uh, the brain is by far the biggest metabolic sink we've got. Uh, that's the, the biggest uh, part. If mechanically, maybe, but it depends again on activity level. Like if you're running a marathon, I guarantee you that marathon's putting out a lot more energy than digesting food. It, it depends very much on other variables. I know I'm getting a little off topic, but good questions coming in here, folks. Love talking to you, folks. Milana saying, hey, Matt, do you know our carbs from chocolate or candy or something other sweet, different than carbs and bread? Is there a difference in carbs? Not really, no. It's, it's more of like the, the assembly of the carbohydrates. Because uh, remember that when we digest things, the whole point of digestion is to break things down into their more elemental parts. It's like deconstructing a, a Lego set, for example, right? If you consume carbohydrate from whole grain bread, that's like a fully assembled Lego race car. And so you bring that into your body and your digestive process is like, well, we've got to break this down in order to use it into simple sugars. So it takes longer to digest and there's whole dietary approaches that are based on this idea versus if you had some lifesaver candies or something, that's like just taking the straight Lego pieces in or it was like sugar water or soda or something like that. And there's pros and cons to both. You know, there's sometimes when you want things to not need to deconstruct, right? When I'm out riding my mountain bike, 
I sure as hell don't want whole wheat bread because I'm like, I need the sugar in my muscles 20 minutes ago. <laughs> you know, I need this stuff now. I sure as hell don't want it to take an hour to digest. That's too long. But for the most part, outside of that, a lot of times people are like, yeah, I want something to digest slowly and not give me this huge sugar rush and a crash or other things. So I want it to fill me and satiate me a lot longer, in which case, yeah, get the whole wheat bread and get some peanut butter on that sucker and things like that. So it's like all things in nutrition and with exercise, it's not good or bad. It's just what are the applications and when do you use it in various circumstances that are best for you? And we run into science fiction, muscle and fantasy world when we think this is the bad stuff and this is the good stuff. And we get all these feelings about it, which are not based in reality. So I usually say I don't worry, though, about the nutritional content of food. I don't base my food choices on nutrition like I base it off of what the food is. So if I'm eating whole grain bread, it's because I'm eating a sandwich. I'm not going to have you know, meat and mayo and stuff between a couple of Hershey bars, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that would be very gross and very disgusting kind of thing. If I'm eating a candy bar, it's because I'm craving chocolate because I want chocolate. You know, if I want a really good, wholesome sandwich for a good lunch or something, I'm going to make it with bread. That's I, I eat food. We don't eat nutrients. We eat food. We get nutrients from food. So my dietary approaches are largely on have your choices based on food. And we get really nitpicky about it's like, well, this whole grain bread is, you know, lower carb. It's like, so what? I don't care if it's lower carb or higher carb or whatever. I am eating it because it's bread. And uh, we get into all sorts of big problems when we are looking at things from a nutrition standpoint. Made that mistake years ago. I was like, oh, this is healthy for me because it's low fat. Like, dude, it's still candy. I don't care if it's high fat, low fat, organic or whatever, it's candy. And you should eat it in the way that you would eat candy in a healthy way. But because we would change how we feel about the food because of what we've been told is based on sound nutrition, we would feel differently about food based on some label on the package. Oh, it says it's uh, organic and low fat. That means it's healthy for me. I'll eat, you know, five candy bars. No, that's not healthy for you. You know, you base it off of food, not nutrition labels and so on. <clears throat> Peter's following up with this thing. Thoughts on the healthy benefits of ice water. Are you talking drinking it or submerging yourself in it? I know there's, uh, I grew up listening to all this where people are like, you know, don't drink ice water and drink this kind of ice water is good. And usually it's minute little influences that don't really matter. And I drink ice water because it's really refreshing, especially in a hot day. That's why I drink it. I don't care about any of the other little details because they're probably too small to really matter. Mariano, oh, I didn't notice this. Happy birthday to the channel. 13 years have passed. Gosh. It feels so much longer than that. It really does. But thank you very much for noticing that sort of thing. But anyway, let's continue with our topic here, tension control. This is why technique is not good enough. This is why loading and programming and stuff is not good enough. Because as I always say, 90% of good technique is invisible. Why I'm always asking people, how does this feel? How does the muscle feel? feel because the visual component of technique is a relatively small uh, variable in the quality of the technique. Most of it is invisible and in what's going on in your nervous system within. That's that tension control. That's most of your good technique because it is the skill of the exercise to use the muscles correctly. And so how can we improve upon this? Because it doesn't matter how your physical technique looks. It is an influence, absolutely, but it's going to be a relatively weak influence. If you're doing a deadlift with a rounded back and you try to straighten it, that doesn't necessarily guarantee your lats are all that much engaged. There's some better engagement. It is going to be better for sure, but it's not even close to the level of tension control you actually are capable of because tension control is one of these things that we can usually aspire to a much higher level than if we were just passively using our muscles while doing an exercise. And when we proactively do it, it 
brings things much, 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 much higher to a much higher degree. It's far better as far as the quality of the technique and the, how well you're using your muscles. And one of the catch 22s with tension control is that you can't really understand it or experience the benefits until you improve it. But it's really hard to improve it if you don't really understand it. So we get this catch 22 back and forth. Cause again, remember it is a subliminal thing. It's just like talking. It's like posture. It's like breathing. All of these sorts of things we have running on subconscious autopilot. And as a result, most of us are not aware of it, not even thinking about it. And so we usually assume it's just good as it is. We usually assume it's running as it should be. Most people have a certain level of tension control in various muscles, and it's always felt that way, and it's always probably been somewhat decent. And so why would they think they need to improve it or even could improve it? Because a lot of it is on subconscious autopilot completely below their level of awareness. But things can change very much if you have injury, which was certainly my case, or imbalances leading to aches and pains and so on. And that can be like, yeah, you know why you have a sore back because this muscle here is not engaging very well. And then you don't want to make the mistake I did for years thinking, well, I'll just do the exercise that works the muscle. Big mistake because exercises don't work muscles. You engage the muscles to do the exercise. So again, even if you've got an exercise that's supposed to be engaging the muscle very well and your technique is very good, if the engagement of that muscle is low enough, it's still not going to do a whole heck of a lot. And even if it does improve, it's probably not going to improve it very much. And you improve that tension control and very quickly, things will get a hell of a lot better very quickly. So the first thing to do is just simply have a basic working of muscular anatomy. Do you know what the muscle looks like under your skin? And do you know particularly the pination of the muscle fibers? Because that's the direction you send tension through. You run tension through your muscles, just like electricity through cable. It runs along the pination of your muscle fibers. And some of the muscles, we just, we don't know it well enough sometimes to know how it contracts, like our glutes, for example, or our lats. I used to think the lats were on the sides of my back. They make up most of your back. And so as a result, my brain was thinking my lats were a certain size and shape, and it wasn't like that at all. So my brain literally had trouble knowing what the muscle was to put tension in it in the first place. So if you're thinking to yourself, I can't really feel my lats during my deadlift. I can't really feel my shoulders during uh, overhead presses or whatever. Take out like a little anatomy book or just go online and be like, okay, what does this muscle look like? Where's the origin? Where's the insertion? Where's the pination of the muscle fibers? What are some of the, the nerves that engage that muscle specifically? That can help as well. And that literally gives you something you can fixate on, visualize in your mind when you're doing the exercise. Other things that can work very well is practicing engaging the muscle specifically with isometric training. And that really makes a difference very, very quickly. I couldn't get my lats to really fire reliably until I started using my ISO trainer. And I made more progress within 48 hours of using, well, it wasn't that, it was a bed sheet at the time, but overcoming isometrics improved the tension control in my back more in 48 hours than I had in the previous five years because that's literally all there is to it. Uh, there's no movement. There's no stability to a large degree. There's no skill involved. It's literally, can you engage the muscle and work as a cohesive unit? That's all isometrics is. So if you're really having trouble engaging a muscle, I encourage you practice some isometrics. And don't worry too much if you're feeling like, I just don't feel my lats. I just don't feel my lats. Literally just keep on it. Tension control is one of those things that can take some time to really develop. And you could spend quite a bit of time not really getting much out of it. And then just one day you're like, oh, oh, well, holy smokes, that, oh, that feels different. And it can always improve too. And it's going to be this great ramp up of things. It's like, wow, wow, oh, holy smokes, wow, that's what, oh my goodness, that's what that's supposed to feel like. 
So it comes on quick when it does. Uh, a week can do really big things. Uh, the other thing too, and isometrics is usually where I go to when people are really struggling with it, uh, lowering the load. So again, with uh, our friend's version there is like adequate load. Well, sometimes you're going to have much better engagement with less loads. When you are doing your neuromuscular conditioning, your strength training stuff, always remember that the more you're pushing towards your limits of your work capacity, the more you reinforce whatever neuromuscular activation patterns you already have. So if you're going towards your heaviest lift or as many reps as you can possibly do on something, you're reinforcing your neuromuscular proficiency. So if you don't have very good activation in your lats or your glutes or your chest, you're reinforcing not having good activation there because you're having trouble improving things. You're just trying to survive it. So backing off and maybe having one workout or maybe a couple of warm-up sets in your workouts where you're using maybe 50% of your normal weight or staying well shy of failure by like five or six reps or so forth and really try again to purposely engage the muscle. Remember, do not assume the exercise will engage the muscle for you. It doesn't work that way. You engage the muscle through your nervous system to do the exercise. Don't make it passive. Make the muscle turn on. When people are doing pull-ups and they're like, I don't feel in my lats. I'm like, well, then turn on your lats. Engage the muscle. You're the only thing in the world that can make that muscle turn on. I can't take a paraplegic, put them on a leg press, and be like, great, now your legs are going to work hard. No, that leg press doesn't do anything for your legs. It doesn't have a direct line into your muscle fibers. Your nervous system does that. That's why they call it the neuromuscular system. It's more about your nervous system than the actual muscles. If your body was a car, your muscles are just the wheels <laughs> that turn, which is important. That's where the proverbial rubber meets the road. But remember, it's your engine that drives things. And your nervous system is your actual engine for your muscles. So you want to be focusing on using that engine a lot better. And then the last thing that I recommend is always make a habit of, quote, setting the tension before you do your exercises. And this takes half a second, especially when you get really good at it. It's real quick and easy to do. But when we just jump into the exercise or we just lift the bar up off the ground or we jump on the pull-up bar and we're just assuming the muscles are going to do what they need to do, that's like me again just running my hand across guitar strings and assuming my fingers are just going to magically hit the right chords. The exercise does not make your muscles engage. You make your muscles engage. And if you want them to engage properly, you have to take just a moment beforehand to turn them on and then you do the exercise. Makes a hell of a difference in the activity that you're doing. So by proactively engaging the muscle, it doesn't need to be as tight as possible, just turn it on. You know, if you're at the top of a pushup and you're like, okay, time to do pushups or even at the bottom, are you, are you engaging your chest? Are you engaging your triceps, your shoulders? Are your abs engaged? All these things, turn them on, make them turn on. If you want the muscle to engage, you have to tell it to engage proactively. And yes, that's a skill. Yes, that takes practice. Yes, it may feel like it's not doing very much for you for the next week or two, or maybe even a month in some cases. But I promise you, when that starts to improve, holy smokes, it will definitely be a lot more residual benefits through every workout you will ever do. All right, let's see what else we can do. Oh, good questions, comments there. Michael's talking. Pistol squats can be challenging. Yep, small weight, just a few pounds in front of me. Very good, I love how you're all supporting each other, helping each other's on out. Peter's asking Mike thoughts on Mike Metzer. I got a lot of people asking about Mike Metzer's stuff and everything. Honestly, like I don't really pay much attention to anyone else's programming and stuff. I know my thing and what I do and stuff. And again, for the most part, folks, when it comes down to, you know, this guy's program versus that guy's program. And I mean, I've got my programs. I got grind style. I got micro workouts. I've got isometrics. I've got suspension calisthenics. I got all this stuff. You know what all this is? The same thing as everybody else. <laughs> it's just a different packaging for the same ideas and stuff. And when we understand how fitness fundamentally works, again, my latest book, 
shameless plug, be fit, live free, you recognize everybody's doing the same thing, you know? And even though it sure looks different, like the vegan at the dinner table and the carnivore guy at the dinner table, they look like they're really different, but no, they're actually following the same thing. They're doing the same thing fundamentally. They're just using different tools. That's all. If I do push-ups on gymnastics rings and the guy next to me is doing weighted push-ups and the other guy next to him is doing dumbbell bench press, we're actually all doing the same thing. And it really boils down more to personal preference than anything else. So it's, does it really matter? Nah, not really. Unless, as I always say, it matters to you. Doesn't matter unless it matters to you. Daniel Constance saying, Matt, free time is super restricted. Well, I hear that. Uh, is it worth it if I do 100 reps a day, push-ups Monday, Tuesdays, Tuesday squats, Wednesdays, essentially hitting the muscle group only once a week. I would spread it out a little bit more if I were you. Uh, my experience, again, I've been doing my one rep a day kind of challenge with particularly handstands and bridges. And that's been, at least for me, working a hell of a lot better. Um, I'm finding that frequency is a very big variable when it comes to things uh, as far as a lot of the softer qualities of training. And I'll be diving into this a little bit more next week when I'm giving my lessons and experiences because that'll be the one month challenge of doing one set per day of the two hardest exercises I've had of handstands and, and bridges. And I've been kind of doing a bunch of other things as well. Uh, it's been really rewarding. And one of the biggest takeaways is that when you think about it, when it comes to volume, uh, you have exponential increase in cost to your mind, body, and lifestyle the more you do something and, and decreasing or diminishing rate of return. So if you have 100 reps, first off, I'm always saying to people like, why are you doing 100 push-ups? Like, why don't you make them harder? <laughs> I would never do something I could do 100 reps with. It's like, it's too easy. Uh, but uh, I'm assuming you're meaning 100 rep total kind of thing. But if... Um, you know, I would, I would say try like 20 push-ups a day uh, or like five days a week. I would spread it out a little bit more than that because you're going to have an easier time developing some of the softer qualities like stability, mobility, tension control, uh, those sorts of things that are a lot easier to develop when you train more frequently. It's kind of like when I was doing Taekwondo once a week and I felt like I couldn't get my sidekick to be anywhere near what it should be until a good 40 minutes into class. But several, well, like 15 years ago or so, I started doing just a little bit of Taekwondo every single day, a few kicks here and there, a couple patterns here and there. And I have much better technique because I don't need to like prepare and recover from being sedentary all the time. But yeah, I think again, it just get in whatever you can, just get in whatever you can. Your workouts just need to get done to some degree. If you do 100 push-ups a week, I don't think it really matters all that much if you do it all at once or if you spread it out throughout the week. My preference is to spread it out, but that's just me. And my opinion matters diddly squat because that's just me working for me. Your opinion matters a heck of a lot more. <clears throat> so a little more clarification, Matt, if I, for example, do squats, my legs will start hurting after some time, no matter if I try to feel my legs or not, if I hang my wrists, uh, will uh, hurt no matter if I want them to hurt or, or not and so forth. Yeah. So remember that doing more work is often the lazy approach to poor proficiency. As I was kind of hinting at earlier, sometimes when we suck at doing something, our way to compensate for that is to just try to do a lot more of it, which reinforces bad patterns and habits much of the time. And so we got to be very careful with just doing more work because as I said earlier, the more we try to work our neuromuscular capacity, the more we challenge that in either both load or volume, the more we're going to reinforce whatever old pattern there is. In fact, we probably are at some point are going to establish new compensatory patterns that aren't going to be very good. Like I used to know a guy who did a ton of squats, like squats, 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 squats. We he would have like 200 of them just for his warm up, And he had no hip extension at the top whatsoever. And so he just never had good hip control with his squats because he was literally training his squats to be as efficient with as little hip control as possible in order to do that kind of volume. So we've got to be very careful with it. Very, very uh, purposeful. All right. Other things coming through. 
Peter's as, as saying a good point here to touch on condition through repetition. Yes, but remember, my friends, that it's not repetition, it's progression. Repetition is only going to help you if you still have the mindset to improve through the repetitions. Otherwise, you're just doing manual labor or running around in circles. We always want to have the mindset of trying to improve. We don't want to just assume that improvement will automatically happen if we just do a lot of work, because very often it won't. Uh, sure wish I knew that back in the day. Most of the work I've done, especially earlier on in my training career, was not nearly as productive as it should have been, largely because I thought if I put in the work, then I'll get the results. And that's not right. <laughs> Michael Blacktree is saying, if I point my feet straight ahead and single leg squat, it makes my knees hurt. So look not at your feet, but at your hips. So if I angle my foot and angle the other leg to help balance, it probably looks silly, but gets a job done. So yeah, look at your hips, my friend. We got our ankles, we've got our hips. Usually a lot of times knee issues are a foot or, or, or an ankle or a hip issue. And in my experience, it's more likely a hip issue. Uh, so remember that your hips got to go to the side a little bit with those single leg exercises. Uh, if you can, you don't want uh, your hip directly behind your knee in the bottom of a pistol squat. You want your foot and your knee close to your center line and your hip off to the side just a little bit. If you want, send me a video. I'll take a look at it. Maybe we're missing something else. It could be nothing to do with your lower body. It could be shoulders. Lots of times hip issues are actually shoulder issues. And if it's a shoulder issue, it becomes a hip issue. A hip issue becomes a knee issue. And it just goes down on the chain. I mean, it's crazy how the body is all interconnected like this, which again is why tension control is so important. Is because a lot of times, especially with the chain training, when we think we have an issue in one area of the body, it's actually an issue in another. Learned that one definitely when I went to my chiropractor years ago. And I had this issue in my lower back slash left hip. And I'm like, I'm sure it's in my shoulder. I'm sure it's in my back. It might be, you know, maybe the knees. And he's like, nope, it's in your neck. I'm like my neck, what are you talking about? And he showed me an x-ray of my neck. And he's like, see how your neck does this? It's supposed to do this other thing instead. We got to fix your neck. And then it <laughs> went all the way down and improved the alignment. And uh, now I don't have that pain anymore. <laughs> and a big part of that therapy, again, was improving my tension control. It's like, yeah, of course your neck is all out of, out of sorts because your lower traps on your right side are completely out of, the, out of the picture. You've got to get that stuff to wake up and engage. Otherwise, your spine's always going to be off. Your right shoulder's always going to be off and your neck is always going to be off and you're always going to have this problem. And no, exercise is not going to fix it. Finally, Dave is saying, Matt, do you practice control during solo taekwondo uh, and or katas? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm always thinking about that. And that's the last piece of tension control is that once you become more aware of the ability to proactively harness tension control and improve it, that becomes like almost the foundation of everything you ever do. Even when I'm walking, I'm like, okay, how am I using my glutes and my hamstrings? Am I uh, engaging my back well, or am I just kind of doing things habitually? Tension control is one of those things that once you start to improve upon it, you'll find opportunities to improve it with everything you do. And now, to a very large degree, everything I do is about tension control and improving how well I'm using my muscles. Taekwondo, hiking, cycling, skiing, uh, all calisthenics, strength training, everything becomes about that. It changes how you perceive your training as a whole. And when it does that, it changes everything you do about your training, it changes everything you experience about it. And it makes it a lot more reliable and uh, also a heck of a lot more rewarding because man, nothing feels better than improving tension control. You know, it's one of those things that radically improves the quality and the satisfaction you get from your training. But for more on that, check out the last couple of videos that I've posted on the RDP YouTube channel. Uh, one is about improving, how to improve it, but also I posted a video on the top, I think it's five signs that your tension control sucks. And so that's a fairly quick video to watch, but it could be fairly enlightening. Check those out. And also remember, I've got that new video coming out later on this week on how to drastically improve the quality of your pull-ups by improving the tension control with those, getting a lot more stress out of the elbows. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel and all that sort of thing. So that way you don't miss that episode. 
I bid you good day. Good luck with your training. And I will talk to you next week where I'll be talking about my updates on my set a day challenge and some of the very enlightening lessons that I've learned throughout the challenge. So I'll talk to you folks then. Till then, be fit and live free.